Once again, to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of everybody involved in the ministry of Bible Talk, we want to welcome you and greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're, we're glad that you can be with us in this study. And we're glad we can be with you. Amen. And I want to remind you before we start that if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Just write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Simple. Well, we're continuing on in our preface, our preamble, our getting into the mood prelude. for and the prelude for our next upcoming study in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's because we want to set the context for this, all right? So you understand, it, it, it's really important to understand what brings this about, what, what the Lord is talking about, what Paul is talking about here, all right? So that's where we are now. This is, our, I think, our third or fourth part, actually, mm. of this preamble, prefix, pre-study, pre prelude. prelude, that's the word I'm looking for, to the Sermon on the Mount, and this will be our concluding one, because on our next next study, we will be actually getting into the Sermon on the Mount itself. Yeah. So before we do that, I'm going to ask my lovely wife, Alice, to ask God's blessing on our time and fellowship today. Hallelujah. Father, we just praise you and thank you. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us. We thank you for the word and for Jesus Christ, your son, who died for us. And it makes it possible, Lord, Amen. for us to be reconciled to you. And Lord, we just ask that tonight the word that goes forth will touch hearts and change lives. Amen. 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 Well, we're in Galatians. And uh, today we're going to be starting, we're going to take a look at some verses in Galatians chapter 5 as a lead up to the Sermon on the Mount. So you can open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, and I did ask if you have any questions or comments, write to yes. us at Bible Talk. Yes, right? Mm -hmm. Got that covered. And and by the way, just for your information, I'm using as a rule my the my Bible of preference in these studies is the New American Standard Bible. Translation, yeah. Um, but typically we will stay with that for the King James okay. or on occasion the English Standard okay. Version. But we want we like versions that are as literal as possible, because I take the Bible literally. I believe that God means what He says Absolutely. and says what He means. All right. So I'm going to start at Galatians five one. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. This whole letter is about freedom. And I said the reason we were looking at, at, at the letter to the Galatians is because this is a church, that, or a group of churches actually, that was filled with people who were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, and walking in the freedom that Christ had purchased. But all of a sudden, Paul is writing this letter of correction to them because they had left that freedom and stepped out of it. And went back and, under the law which put them and made them subject to another yoke of slavery. You see, religious practices and traditions do not set you free, but righteousness sets us free, sets us free to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose, all right? So bear that in mind as we go through this, just this little bit of a, a start here. Galatians 5, 6 says this, For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. You see, it's not about the law. It's not about traditions. It's not about those traditions of men, but it's about faith and love. Amen. Right? And it, it's a constant conflict. I mean, here, look at this, this group of churches, and they were walking well, and then all of a sudden they're not, because they were under attack from the enemy. And the enemy is always trying to put us into bondage, right? What does it mean to be about faith and love? There's going to be a conflict. Well, you know, if you're going to get involved in a conflict, remember that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, That's right. okay? Mm -hmm. And this is an ongoing battle. It's always there. As long as we're here on this planet, 
But so think of what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. First Thessalonians 5 a. That's, that's, that's armor, that's war talk, right? Amen. Yeah. The breastplate plate of faith and love. Does that put you in mind of any other verses? The armor of God. The whole armor of God in Ephesians, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because in Ephesians, Paul wrote, Therefore, take up the full armor, the whole armor of God, so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6, 13 and 14. Wait a minute now. Is it the breastplate of faith and love or is it the breastplate of righteousness? Come on. It's all of it. <laughs> well, because it's the same thing. You, know, you need to get the idea that Scripture interprets Scripture. Mm -hmm. So if in one place Paul is talking about the breastplate, Paul doesn't contradict himself. Yeah. He doesn't say one thing to this church and another thing to another church and they're, they're not equivalent. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the breastplate of righteousness is the same as the breastplate of faith and love. Right? So faith and love working together equals righteousness and protects your heart. Right. right. That's, a, that's a rather important thing to protect your heart. So he went on in Galatians and said, and I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. You see, I mean, it's either. You're going to, you're going to walk in, you're, you're righteous, you're, your religion Mm -hmm. is either going to be the righteousness of God or it's going to be the traditions of men, right? And if it's the traditions of men, you're not holding fast to the well, commandments no, of God. It's going to put you under bondage again. Mm -hmm. The flesh and the, the flesh and your flesh and your spirit are constantly in conflict. Yes. And by the way, Galatians is not the only place that Paul talks about that. He probably talks about it in Romans, mm -hmm. in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. He writes about it to the Thessalonians in both letters. Of it. It's everywhere in the New Testament. They're in opposition to one another. So you need to make a decision in your life that you are going to do the things that please God that are listed in Scripture, and those are the things of the Spirit. Yeah. And remember, it says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Yeah. It doesn't take much participation in the traditions of men to get you in a downslide out of the the path of righteousness. Okay. Think of the deeds of the flesh. Now, this is one of the reasons I said the Galatians was an important letter for us to look at, because it talks about, this is a great instruction on how to live and walk either in the flesh or in the spirit. So if you're going to walk according to the deeds of the flesh, they're evident, Paul says in verse 19, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a scary one. Well, is it, you know, there's a lot of people who debate, can you lose your salvation? I don't believe for a minute you can lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. I believe you can give it up. I, I believe you can walk away from it. But that, I'm not going to get into Armenianism and Calvinism right now. But the fact of the matter is, it's possible, as far as I can tell in Scripture, for you to desert God. I mean, that's, that's what it talked about. And, and this is what I think is so interesting. And, you know, the number of the beasts is, John, is 666. Well, in John 6, verse 66, mm -hmm. and, and before, 60 to 66, it talks about the fact that there were Christians who chose to walk away from Jesus because his word was too difficult. They deserted him. And, and this isn't saying that if you're angry or if you are jealous 
or if you have alpha bursts of anger or going on and on, that you're going to lose your salvation. You won't, it's practicing these practicing. things. Practicing. I'm going, yes. Yes. So yeah. It's not something that just happens, but it's something that you're... We all you're sin and fall short of the glory of yes. God. I mean, the fact is, but thank God that if we're faithful to confess our sins, it says that he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. But you got to be careful about practicing sin. Right. You have to be careful about doing something habitually, all right? Because that's an indication that you're not walking according to the Spirit. So let me go back to the Sermon on the Mount for a minute. Jesus said in Matthew 7, I'm going to read verses 15 all the way to 20. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. This is one of the reasons I talk about the, the link between the, now of course all scripture is linked together, right? Mm -hmm. And connected often, more often than not in ways we don't even see. But the fact of the matter is, this letter to the, this letter to the Galatians and the Sermon on the Mount are really tightly. Yes. Because because Paul, who had been such a Pharisee, so absolutely ingrained in the traditions of the elders, mm -hmm. and now is set free as he meets and encounters Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he's an expert on this. He truly is. And he, so he's saying that, but he goes on in Galatians to say that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You know, it says, let a man examine himself. We need to examine ourselves. We need to look at the Word of God. We should be abiding in the Word of God, dwelling in the Word of God, led by the Holy Spirit, given, shown, shown the grace of the Word by the Holy Spirit, who is sent to lead us into all truth. And we should be being faithful to say, you know, am I doing this or not doing this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because there's a simple answer. If you find that you're not doing something right, there's a simple answer. Repent. Confess your sin to Jesus Christ. Confess God, your sin to God. God has made a way. He has. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross to take That's away, right. pay the price for our sins, right? Right. See, and now I'm going to go on to the next verse, Galatians 5.24, where Paul says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It says in Colossians, I have died. My life is hidden with Christ in God. Right? So if they've been crucified, you can't be practicing. Well, no, you're dead. That's right. <laughs> the problem is so much of the church today seems to be what I hear the preaching I hear is about oh you are this and God you are this and God you, you know you're so special well you know what we are we are precious in the eyes yes. of God but the simple fact of the matter is the goal is not what you're to become in God here but what you're not to become what are you not what are you not to become you're going to become nothing yeah, that's what we have to become that's what we have to become is nothing I mean John the Baptist had it right when he said uh I must decrease, but he must he must increase, but I must decrease. Mm -hmm. We have to become nothing so Christ becomes everything in our lives. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, there's so much teaching about all the things you can be. This is what it's like the army, the army be here in the United be. States. Be all you can be. Be nothing. That's the goal. Be nothing. And I've shared this before, but I just feel like to share it again. On my 70th birthday, back seven years ago, Alice and I were just, we had just returned from Kenya. We, returned, well, we had returned, we'd gone from Kenya back to England and back to Wales where we had been ministering. And uh, we were at a conference in Wales. And the conversation had turned to the heaven. Yeah, yeah. How God created everything. How God created everything in seven yes. days out of nothing, absolutely out of nothing. And it just struck me as we were having this conversation. 
it struck me that here it was my I had just done my 70th birthday. So I, I, I had this little conversation with the Lord. I said, Lord, why is it that I'm 70 years old and you're not finished with me yet? And I'm just going to say this as clear as I can hear Alice. The Lord said to me, because you're not nothing yet. Well, keep working on us until we're, until we're nothing. nothing. God <laughs> creates out of nothing. He doesn't want to just change what we are and make us nicer. He wants to make us. We're a new creation. Brand new. So don't be afraid to become nothing in Christ Jesus. That you might become everything in Christ Jesus. And Christ will be evident in everything in you and everything through you. What do you think it means when those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires? We have to choose to die. That's right. No man can follow me, Jesus said. No man can be my disciple unless he denies himself, dies to himself, picks up his cross and follows me daily. So, you know, what Paul said, uh, and I just quoted this a minute ago, set your mind on the things above, mm -hmm. not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 2 and 3. What's the difference between what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, but seek first his kingdom, the Father's kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get us to be willing to be nothing so that we might be and have everything. Amen. I promise you this. Jesus Christ is not trying to deny you any good thing. He is trying to keep you away from the things that you may think are good that will take you away from those good things. We have to trust in God. We have to believe in him. Faith is our belief in him. And it has to start with that. But it has to be a faith that believes that he well, you know, I'll go back to Paul, what he said in Romans. He said, if God, he points to the cross and says, if God the Father would put Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, on that cross in my place, what good thing would he withhold from me? He's not trying to deprive you of anything. He's trying to give you everything that's good. But we have to do that. We have to, we have to focus on righteousness, not on religion. Because the practices of the flesh will not gain you a right relationship with Jesus Christ, and then therefore not with God the Father. It's about taking that free gift of salvation. It's not a by works, lest any man should boast. It is a free gift of God. You can't do anything to earn God's love. You don't have to do anything to earn God's love. He loved us before we he loved, loved him. him. And he proved it at the cross. Yes. So all we have to do is be willing to receive that blessing on his terms, okay? Thank you, Jesus. All right, so I really do want to get into the Sermon on the Mount. So I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. This, I think, is a key okay. to what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It's an account, it's in all, the three Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all right? And I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'm going to intermix them. This is what's called a harmony, right? Here are three Gospels that tell, this, they, uh, tell the same account. But they have a different view or a different position. They see things a little bit different. Not that they are different, no. but they're seeing, you know, it's like Mark. He sees that when he's talking about the feeding of the 5,000, he notices that the grass is green. Right. That's not changing anything. No. He's just giving more detail. So I'm going to mix three, three Gospels. Luke, I'm reading from Luke 6, Matthew 12, and Mark chapter 3. And I'm going to start at Luke 6. This is talking about Jesus. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him, that's Jesus, mm -hmm. watching Jesus closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath, so that they might find reason to accuse him. In other words, they're looking to harm Jesus. And they questioned Jesus, asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? 
And they asked that so that they might accuse him. And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath? Will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the, uh, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to them, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored to normal like the others. Matthew, that's from Matthew 12, 13. But they themselves were filled, this is still going back to them, right, the Pharisees, they were filled with rage. They went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. It was at that time that he, Jesus, went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. That whole night that he spent in prayer to God was the night before he taught the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. So what do you think he was doing? Well, you know, it says in John chapter 12 that Jesus didn't teach anything. He didn't say anything that he didn't hear from the Father. Right. So he went up to have a conversation with the Father. And he came back and preached the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. So that was the heart of the, the Father. But what's so interesting in this, too, is the fact that when he looked at them all, he said with anger. With anger. I mean, a lot of people think that God can't be angry. Well, you better wake up. I'm telling you something. God is love. But the other side of that coin is that he is righteous and just, and he, is, he has the power to be angry. And because these guys weren't taking care of God's sheep. Well, I, and if you don't understand that, please just pick a prophet. Mm -hmm. Go back and read Isaiah. Go back and read Jeremiah. Go back and read Ezekiel and see how God responds to these. He says, woe to the shepherds of Israel. Right. Because they didn't care about the people that God the Father had entrusted to them. They were, they were, they were abusing them. them. They were abusing them. And do you not think that's still going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it should be obvious to anybody who's walking in the Spirit. All right? But let me just read what it says in John 12, 49 and 50. Okay. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given, a, given me a command as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. You get this now? Jesus Christ went up the mountain after having this encounter with the Pharisees and then the Herodians and the, the, the scribes, where they didn't care about the, some of a man who had a withered hand. They didn't care about him. Their only, their only interest in being there was to be able to condemn Jesus Christ for what he did. Trying to catch him. Trying to catch him. Yeah. That is not the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus is to do the will of the Father. And he doesn't do anything that was not the will of the Father. He doesn't do anything or say anything that he had not heard from the Father. So when we go in now to the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to know that you are hearing, you may be hearing the words of Jesus, but you are hearing the heart of the Father. Amen. That's the heart of the Father. And this is taking people to get them from being religious to being righteous. Because righteousness is what God desires. Anybody can do religious rituals. Oh, yeah. I mean, practically, practically everybody does. I mean, now it's gotten to the place. This is the, this may be one of the most irreligious times in the history of mankind. Okay, and that's why you know it says in the Proverbs, only the fool says in his heart there is no God, because at the time everybody believed in God, mm -hmm. not necessarily a true God, but, but, believe but everybody in believed God. in a God. This this is probably the single most atheistic period in mankind's yes. history. God's gonna take. God's gonna deal with that. All right. So the thing is, starting next week, we're going to get into the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to look at that as this is the instruction for how we are to live. That's right. Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, the Word says. Amen. Written that we might have life and have the abundance of life. But the abundance of life doesn't come by seeking the things of the world. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the rest shall be added unto you. So please, be back with us again next week as we get into the Sermon on the Mount, and be prepared for an in-depth study that you will participate in, that you'll be a part of. It's good to hear the word. Amen. But you know what? You've got to do more than hear the word. you got to be a doer. You've got to hear it, believe it in your heart. You've got to confess it with your mouth, and then you've got to do it. That's the key. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you're so generous, that you did for us what we can never do for ourselves, that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place, that we might have that fullness of a relationship with you, that we might have righteousness. Lord, help us to understand, to learn, and to walk in that righteousness and to be a living witness to that righteousness to everybody we come in contact with. Because indeed, these days are growing dark and short. Use our lives, Lord. Use our lives for your purpose, that we might bring glory to your name. I ask that, Father, in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, so until next week then, may the Lord our God bless you to bits. Spend time in the Word. Spend time in fellowship. Now, that may be hard in this day and age. You know what? Pick up your telephone and call, call somebody and talk to them about Jesus. Get on, get on one of the video services. Get in touch with somebody and share Jesus Christ. We have been called out of darkness, Peter said, to proclaim in his marvelous light, to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless you and goodbye until next week. Bye-bye. to come.